Regina, that important theme of, of access, is, is that relevant to your definition of freedom? Are, are your ideas of freedom very much bound up with what you've been engaged with in your career in relation to language or, or, or linguistic freedom? Or how would you define it? Yeah, to some extent. And I think for me, I'm coming from probably a linguistic and cultural background as well. Um, to me, though, freedom, probably where I grew up, also had a huge influence on my uh, definition of freedom. And I think um, I would concur with what Fiach has said there about you know, a definition of Irish freedom or what is Irish freedom. I mean, when, I, when we were given this topic and in the 21st century, I mean, my, my initial reaction was, well, freedom in a general context to me is the ability and the, perhaps the right to a normal life regardless of creed, culture, class, gender, or sexual mm. orientation, basically. Then Irish freedom, well, you know, my question was, well, what is unique to Irish freedom and what is not unique to Irish freedom? And I think we've very much seen that this morning in the context of the repossession, perhaps, of our global culture. And um, even listening uh, there to the presentation, to say, you know, for somebody to say, well, you know, we believe that this is the best in the world, and he was talking in the Australian context. How often do we say that in Ireland, that we believe that we are the best in the world at, in anything, and yet we are? Um, so for me, um, I, I looked at it in that context, but also in the context of freedom in practice and freedom, uh, the ideology of freedom. And in, the, in that context, then I took it further down to the elephant in the room, which is the political freedom, and I'm not... A politician or any expert in politics or, uh, in, in, or a historian. My area is language and culture. But um, I, I did look at this in the context of a question, actually, that you raised last night, Jeremy, on who we are. And I think it's difficult to do this without looking at it in the context of the commemoration uh, period. And there was one um, article, actually, that uh, Michael McDowell had in, uh, as part of the commemoration series in 2006. And actually, um, I'll just read a little bit of what he said. Um, as the question came up last night, I thought it was fitting maybe to put it in. We are who we are. We have come from where we have come from. But, he continues, as a 21st century Irish Republican, I believe that recent events more than ever set us the challenge of reconciling green and orange. That aspiration of the 1916 proclamation remains unfinished business and the 90th anniversary celebration, now the 100th, should not blind us even momentarily to our challenging Republican uh, vocation of reconciliation. And just maybe to move that forward then to the next, the cost of that identity. And I mean, that is, this often influences the understanding of Irish freedom today. And while we look at this maybe in the context of the 1916 rising, in the context of this school at this time, this didn't go unnoticed to those who were in the GPO at the time. And perhaps the poet revolutionaries, if you like, and in Des Fitzgerald's memoirs, uh, he refers very poignantly to uh, Pierce's difficulty with uh, the moral rectitude of what they had undertaken. And while Plunkett, uh, uh, as he said, uh, Plunkett could forget in conversation, as he was a poet, the facts that surrounded us. Sometimes when there were only two of us together, we would talk about literature and writers, and he would ask questions about writers who were friends of mine, but with Pierce it was different. And he could see that, that struggle. So that's another struggle. But the other cost was the women of 1916 and the women, um, the widows, the, out, of the, out of the 15 who were executed, there were seven widows who were treated probably abominably um, after that by both the um, black and tans and the auxiliaries and by the Irish Free State afterwards. And, um, so, um, and are we still struggling with equal opportunities for women? And as a woman, I, I do feel very strongly about this. As uh, Sinead McCool tells us, the, ide the ideals enshrined in the proclamation of a land of equal opportunities did not apply to these women. So th that, that's another uh, issue. Um, you yourself then, moving on from that, Jeremy, uh, in 2006, I'm not sure if you remember this in the Irish Times, but one of, you, one of the things that you said was, and I think there was a reiteration of this last night, we do not need to apologise for this in 21st century Ireland, nor should we ignore it. And I think that is key to where we are in, in this context of <coughs> Irish freedom today. Um, 
looking at all the milestones and particularly through the 20th century, uh, Bertie Ahern outlined um, the 1916, 1937, the Constitution, 49, the Republic, uh, 1972, the uh, Treaty of Rome, and 1998, and then the, the Good Friday Agreement. But his take on this was that time and time again, we have renewed hope in the future. So maybe that's another aspect of identity that we need to look at. And uh, he, he said that the, the uh, radical idealism that shook the world in 1916 still challenges us today. So finally then, just with the, the, the cultural aspect of it, I think it's, it's almost impossible to view our Irish freedom in a current and contemporary context without looking at where we have come from. And I think it's very important that we express our Irish freedom today in the context of our cultural past and our global uh, contemporary diaspora. And there were three specific organizations, and Fiach um, is uh, obvious, uh, m much more um, uh, knowledgeable on this than I am with the Irish Literary Theatre, but the main three, and I think he has given a very good contemporary um, summary of what this entails today, but when this was founded, the Irish Literary Theatre, the GAA, and the uh, Gaelic League, they were three of the main organisations in the, last, the latter half of the, the uh, 19th century, which formulated much of what we have enshrined as part of our doctrine, if you like, of uh, Irishness today and of also our Irish freedom as opposed to um, a global freedom. And just to look at the background, for example, Thomas Clark, he returned from South Africa in 1864 to, as he said, an Irish country that was uh, in, a revolution, in a revolutionary period where Irish language was being encouraged, Irish music and dancing and games were being brought to the fore. These are quotes that I'm reading. Uh, the other one, if we take Anya Kant, for example, um, Eamon Kant's wife, she says the same. After the Parnell split further on in 1891, there was no interest taken in politics by the young folk, quote. There were too many divisions. The Gaelic League, believe it or not, which is now symbolised, perhaps, and that has actually been a huge element for me as an Irish language speaker, the, the lack of freedom, perhaps, to, to feel sometimes that I can't use my language in certain circumstances due to the connotations that have evolved in that context, which to me is just a language. Um, the, as she said, the Gaelic League, where there were no politics spoken, was a mecca for everyone. This is in 1891. Uh, sorry, 1893 after that, um, but this was um, uh, after the Parnell split in 1891. The people learned that they had a country with a language. They learned the music, the dancing, the games, and they were encouraged to have Irish manufactured goods. So uh, the same with the GAA. Uh, Michael Cusack in 1887 predicted sport as, as a method for Irish um, for promoting our Irishness. If we see that the rising generation receives that athletic exercise and training which could coexist with a bold and spirited people and if we impress upon them the great necessity for vigorous and manly practices, I note that the women aren't included here, however, we shall be doing giant work for the preservation of the Irish race and the future of the Irish nation. So that's basically where I, that, that, that to me, to ignore our past and the present practice and understanding of Irish freedom I think, is to discard the ideals of the practice in which this country was formulated. However, we need to take ownership of that in the current climate, and we need to see what is unique and what is not unique, because revolution was um, part of many, many uh, histories uh, in the global diaspora. So um, I suppose basically, and to go back to what um, Fiach has also said, the issues of dignity, respect, tolerance, values, all of those are, and I, but I do think it's important that we maintain the ideology which formulated uh, what, what we are today. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia.